everybody. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. Uh, recently, we completed a case study here at TOPS, uh, profiling a management company and their growth story over the last decade or so. And today, we're going to be unpacking that webinar and sharing some of the takeaways from it. Uh, real quickly, we want to introduce everybody we've got on the panel today. Uh, you've got myself, Mike Hardy, President and CEO here at TOPS. Also joining us is Terry. Uh, Terry, are you here? I am here. How are you guys doing? Great. It's good to have you, Terry. Uh, Terry and I've worked at TOPS for over 10 years, and pretty much over that period of time, uh, we've gotten to know our, our client that we're profiling today, Mr. Jeff Harmon. Uh, Jeff, are you with us today as well? I am. Terrific. Uh, thanks for being here today, Jeff. Appreciate your time. Well, absolutely. Uh, today, we're going to be looking at a case study that Jeff and his company, Community Management LLC, participated in. Uh, Jeff has been in the community management industry now for about 13 years. Um, and as we kind of got to know Jeff and learn a little bit about his story, it's really kind of neat how Jeff and his team have had a, a lot of success over the, the last several years. And we wanted to kind of break it out today, Jeff, for you to think about, okay, uh, you, your journey, you started like a lot of management companies from just an idea mm -hmm. and from an idea to kind of getting that business off the ground. Then kind of the, the second chapter of your story, just kind of that, that really explosive growth chapter where you guys were really kind of acquiring a lot of business. And then like kind of the third chapter, which is really that story about, okay, we've gotten to a certain level of success. Now we got to kind of find a way to scale it and make it very sustainable. So does this sound like a good agenda for you today? Fantastic. Sounds great. All right. Terrific. So, and uh, bear with me because I'm going to look at notes on my phone while we do this. Uh, so Jeff, let's go back to 2007. You know, what had you been doing career-wise prior to creating Community Management LLC? And what was it that made you decide to get into community management? Sure. Um, so prior to um, starting community management, I was running a financial counseling company with my dad, actually right out of college. Um, was doing that for a while and uh, had no real estate background, no property management background. Um, and, um, it's, it actually, we kind of stumbled into it. Uh, we, I went to a friend's house one night before going to dinner with, uh, him and his wife and my wife and, and on their counter, they had a piece of paper. Uh, and it, it's, it was said that he owed money to a, an HOA. And I was like, what the heck's an HOA? Um, and he said, oh, it's the people we, you know, we pay to make sure the fountains are running and that the grass is cut. And, uh, I said, well, who does that? And he, well, some, some volunteer people that live in the neighborhood. And, and, and I said, well, they, they get paid. And no, they don't get paid. And I was like, well, you couldn't pay me to do that. And then we kind of both looked at each other. It's one of those weird moments in life where you both look at each other and you're like, wait a second, you could pay me to do that. Um, and then from there, we just researched it and, and realized that there was a need in our state, Louisiana, uh, for it. And um, realized that, uh, you know, just like anything else in life as entrepreneurs, you, you look for opportunities where you maybe think you can do things better or there's a better way to do things. And, um, and we jumped right in feet first. When you look back in those days, I mean, you had no idea what you're getting into. None, <laughs> <laughs> none. Uh, no, we, we really thought, uh, truthfully, Mike, that if we got, you know, 20 or 30 or 40 neighborhoods, uh, we could, you know, get the, the mailbox money that uh, every entrepreneur always thinks about uh, when they're young. And um, we really didn't put a whole lot of thought into organization part of it. Um, we figured we could hire one person, slap some Microsoft uh, spreadsheets together, maybe use a little QuickBooks. Uh, and, and man, we would be, we would be big time. And um, well, that, that wasn't so much the case. <laughs> Well, when you think back in those days, I mean, you, you mentioned QuickBooks, you mentioned like Microsoft, like what were your thoughts about how do you like uh, get into community management, what tools you wanted to use? Sure. So, you know, again, no real estate background on my end, but one of my friends, uh, one of my partners, um, he, he had a real estate background. So as far as being able to drum up business, uh, that part we kind of had because we had some relationships with a few developers and um and we, again, we weren't looking at big size growth, right? We just wanted a few. 
And so our thinking was, okay, well, we know we need to collect people's money, right? That's easy enough. Um, mm -hmm. We need to keep track of the money and we need to pay bills, right? I mean, that's, in our mind, that was all there was to it. Um, and, and so thinking we could create some Excel spreadsheets to keep track of residents in the neighborhood or use QuickBooks. Um, and, and that was fine, I guess, in the first couple of years um, as we really weren't growing very much. But then I think we came to realize pretty soon that the reason we weren't growing very much is because we were kind of hampered by the, the the tools we were we were using. Yeah, it, may, it makes sense. I mean, yeah, I think a lot of companies kind of when they get out the gate, they're they're not looking to kind of overly invest in uh, tooling. Maybe they're 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 kind of getting their toes in the water a little bit, trying to to manage those expenses. But you talk about that, you know, some of these takeaways, you know, those first four years of the business, looking at the math, you guys went from one community to about 20 communities over the span of four years. Um, I mean, that's, I mean, that in and of itself is a pretty significant achievement. Yeah, but we didn't feel so. Um, we, we, you know, it's one of those things, Mike, where we really felt like we had a good idea of what was needed. Uh, you know, after we got in there for the first couple of years, we realized that just collecting payments and paying bills was not quality management services. Um, that there was a lot more that could be done. But just like if, you know, you could have all the greatest ideas in the world, but if you don't have the right tools, you're not going to, to do what you want. You're not going to accomplish your goals. Um, I think I told you before, you know, if you gave Michelangelo a crayon, he isn't doing the Sistine Chapel, right? Um, no matter how big of a genius he was and a vision, he needed the right tools. And we, you know, around that fourth year mark is when we really started investigating and realizing that the tools we had were just insufficient to get us to the level we wanted to be at. That's interesting. So when you go back, you know, was that the biggest challenge you saw that was holding you guys back? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Yeah, it yeah. wasn't. It wasn't lack of a market. Um, there was plenty of market where we were at. Um, our our uh, our our willingness, our desire. Um, you know, going out and drumming up business. Like I said, one of my partners had uh, connections in the real estate industry already. It was simply that we weren't able to streamline enough to where we really wanted to keep growing. Because you know, as a as a business owner, you have to look at you know how are your margins squeezed as you grow vertically. And we noticed real quick that our margins were going to get squeezed real thin uh, at the way we had set our business operations up because not having the right tools in our industry means you have to replace that with manpower. And yeah. I think as we all know, manpower is your single biggest cost if you don't keep it under control. So we realized that there wasn't anything holding us back except ourselves and our, our, our hesitancy to invest money and really take the next step in finding those industry leading tools that we needed to do what we we wanted. Yeah, no, that makes a, that makes a lot of sense. So when we started to kind of talk to you and, and kind of review the case study and learn about kind of your journey, uh, this kind of next five year window really saw community management LLC explode on the scene. So you know, for everybody on the webinar today, you know, some of the the milestones in this business. January 2011, like we just talked about, 20 communities under management, five staff. By May of 2016, they had 130 additional communities in a five-year window. So, you know, as we think about this, you just kind of talked about it. You know, 2010 is when you guys chose Tops mm -hmm. to kind of be that provider. What was the thing that you kind of recall that really made you say, it is time to invest in technology to grow the business? Sure. It was just the, 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 again, the realization that there was a lot of potential um, as the, the, the timeline you're showing the next five years, uh, there was potential out the wazoo, not even anything that we could ever imagine. We were extremely blessed uh, to, to, to be a part of it. But we realized that we were holding ourselves back. Um, and again, it wasn't for lack of a wanting to invest um, in money into the company, but we just realized we were investing it in people when it's way more efficient and way more productive if you can invest it in tools and technology. And so uh, one of my partners, to his credit, was uh, more technologically savvy than myself. Um, I barely was able to get on this webinar. So, but he was able to, um, he was able to really investigate it. And what we knew we wanted was a tool that was, has been around for a while, 
that had a great reputation, that knew the industry. And we quickly realized too, from trying to use QuickBooks and Excels and a few other ins and out programs, that we wanted a software tool that combined as many of the things we wanted to do or worked with as many of the software that we wanted in one spot. And that's where, you know, that's where y'all kind of checked all the boxes. Tops really did for us. Yeah. Yeah. No, I appreciate you saying that. I mean, I look at this, this window of time and, and you guys grew about 750% <laughs> from January, 2011 to, to May of 2016, you know, beyond the software, you know, when you and I were talking a little bit, you know, how much did your understanding of the industry itself also kind of contribute to kind of this growth? I and mean, we talked yesterday a little bit about kind of connecting all the dots and, and in the experience you guys acquired, for a lot of people on the call today, they might be at that 20 community level, that 50 community level, that 100 community level. Sure. Here. But how, like, this is a this is a pretty substantial growth pattern right here. What else was going on for you guys? Um, besides getting all this gray hair, uh, because that amount of growth, while it uh, while it looks great on paper, when you're going through it, there's there's definitely a reason they call it growing pains. Look, the biggest thing that we had to realize is that you can't succeed from a place of fear. Um, and I think a lot of small business owners, um, including myself uh, at the time, you're, you're afraid to get out in front of the need. You're afraid to get out in front of where you want to be. And what I mean by that is you, you see that, okay, if you invest in better software or you invest in more staff in critical places or you invest in more marketing that, oh my gosh, there's probably a really good chance to grow there. But you don't because you're like, what if I invest that money and it doesn't pay off? Now I'm out of that money. And so I would tell anybody who's kind of sitting there going, okay, I'm in a spot now where I feel comfortable, but I'd really like to grow more. You, you're going to have to let, you're going to have to put fear aside and, and, and replace it with just belief that, you know, if you have a great idea and a great product and in your mind, you know how to put it together, do it. Um, I will tell you uh, two, two things to, I would hope encourage people. First, I have no property management experience. So um, I have never, sent out one violation letter i have never uh i have never uh accepted one resident payment um i've maybe been to a handful of board meetings um and so while that may shock some people to go oh my gosh how could you you know how could you do that it's it's because where i lack in the knowledge of the industry i knew that i had to surround myself with people that knew it well and more importantly with technology that could help us um putting myself with technological partners who were able to point me to other vendors in the industry that also could help me and teach me how to leverage their knowledge and their technology to put myself in a better position to succeed. Um, the other, I think one of the fallacies in our, our industry is that you have to go out and acquire your business, right? We've never purchased one contract. Um, we, we just, we've not done that. We've grown to our number organically. And um, while I'm not saying that purchasing isn't a, a mergers and acquisitions are not part of our industry, I would tell you that um, it's more to me about putting together a good product, understanding what you want to be as a company, and then really critically finding the right tools. I know I keep using the word tools, but I'll just keep going back and saying it over and over again. If you don't have the right tools, you can have all the right intentions. You're not going anywhere. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, that's a real, I mean, those are, those are some really great points. So when you think about that, you you think about not doing any M and A to get to where you guys are at, and so that this is all organic growth. Were you tempted at any point to buy a business? I mean, just out of curiosity, for some of the people on the call today, they might be looking at purchasing a business. Were you tempted at any point to go buy something? Well, yes, of course. Um, I mean, there was always that temptation to 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 kind of quickly grow the portfolio. Our biggest concern was um, being able to to merge not only our cultures with those that we would be doing, um, but also integrating uh, our processes, our procedures, and our tools. You know, you I, I, I know it can work because I have good friends in the industry that it's worked for their companies. Um, but for us, we were just more focused on fine tuning what we do. You know, mm -hmm. do, being the best at what we do, and I felt like if we were spending a lot of our time having to take another company's processes and procedures and people and tools and figure out either how to make them work with what we have or, or getting rid of them and putting ours in place. 
it would have just taken away from our fine tuning. Um, and, and, and I think there was something to be said for my team that they never felt like there was going to be a lot of turnover or turmoil because my team was important to me. And as we grew with our staffing, I wanted them to always feel like, Hey, this is a place of stability. Um, yeah. and that's kind of where we went. That's, that's really interesting. Uh, it's kind of funny too, you shared, and I'm glad you did, that you've actually not come at this industry from doing the job. You've come into this as kind of a, a business perspective. So, so many people in community management kind of go the other way. They start off being sure. community managers and, and become community management company executives. Um, how important has it been for you to be focusing on the business instead of necessarily working in the business? Sure. It's critical. Um, and I fully, I say that fully recognizing that um, we all have to put food on the table. So uh, I was in a position that I had another business. And so I was able to use that and, and reinvest our money. Um, so I don't want to come from a position that sometimes you hear, you know, you, you got to, if you want to be a business owner and grow, you got to be get completely out of the business and work just on it. Right. Well, a lot of people are going to look at me and go, that's great, but I've got to, you know, I've got to feed the family. Um, and so what I would tell you is that what that means for some people is that they may have to do on the weekends or on the evenings, slowly look at ways that they can seed control of certain things. Because I think the number one thing for a business owner to, to learn, especially one that grew their business from the ground up, is they're so used to being in control and having their hands on every decision that's made that there's that fear again that, okay, well, if I give all this to this person, they're not going to do it exactly how I want it. Oh my gosh, we're all going to be in trouble. Um, yeah. and, and I still struggle with that. You know, we have 60 employees. I have team leads for all of my different departments. And just today on my team lead meeting, I was having to talk to them about my nature is to be a very much process and procedures guy. So I like to get my hands in there and help with the, the operational changes. But I also realized that in order for me to grow our scope and our services and really push our culture, I had to let that go. So I would tell any business owner who's right now trying to grow their business that you have to find in the beginning little ways to give up pieces of control of the day to day operations, because you'll learn that as you give that up, it your time to work on and grow the business increases exponentially. Yeah. No, I mean, it's it's an excellent point because you do got to put food on the table. Uh, but at some point, you really got to be intentional about the business. That's right. Um, you know, when you look kind of a, as we kind of cap this chapter in your story, it'd be really easy for you to sit there and say, we've just exploded over the last five years. Sure. Don't change a thing. Right. Right. Like, it'd be very easy to sit there and say, Let's it isn't broken, let's not fix it. But sure. yet you decided at the end of this kind of time, it was time to kind of reconsider your strategy as a company and also your technology strategy. What what were you what was going on there? I will tell you that um the growth we experienced in those five years was it, it took its toll. Um uh, you have to kind of be ready for that. And and there was a cliche in business that you can grow too fast. Um you also, you're never going to try to turn away growth when you're a small company trying to get bigger. Yeah. I will tell you that our philosophy or the philosophy that I've always been taught and that I, I try to share is that I don't, that success is not the goal. Um, success is a byproduct or it should be a byproduct. Um, and what I mean by that is, is we just continue to focus on how do we get better? You know, how does the technology we use get better? How do the processes, how do the services we offer get better? How do we learn uh, when maybe we lose a client? What did we do wrong? How do we learn? And in doing so, I've never set a number of HOAs as a goal because I feel like if you do that, what happens when you get there? Like yeah. you said, you become content. And, and con to me, contentment is the killer of greatness. When you become content, you have no ch chance of becoming great. Um, and so... I would hope that any business owner, especially in our industry, knows that I would never set a number of uh, doors or units or HOAs or condominiums on your on your your board in your office. If you want to put a goal on there, it should be every day to get better. If that's your goal and you're doing it, then success will become a byproduct. Um, and, yeah. and then as far as realizing the tools we had, I think. The, the biggest thing when you grow that fast or you get to a certain point is you have to start looking at inefficiencies in your business. So when we were really small, it was we didn't have the right tools. 
when we got to that medium size, it was, okay, if we're going to really become scalable here, where we can not just operate in our local market, but we can operate in any market anywhere, we have to become scalable. And that's when we had to start really looking at making sure the tools we had would allow us to do that, right? You would, would, would be in, on the internet, in the cloud, so that anybody working from anywhere can do the job, out, both out in the field, from a remote office, even from home. Yeah, no, like, yeah, actually, that, that makes a... It makes a ton of sense. I could see how, you know, when you're when you're growing that fast, you're maybe not stopping to kind of assess are we growing the way we want to grow, or are we growing sure. in a way that's sustainable? So stopping, look at those inefficiencies, thinking about how to solve that. You're a process guy. Yeah, that was probably um, you know a lot of your bandwidth thinking about that. Yes, it was. Yeah. So as we we kind of get into this kind of third chapter of community management. Um, this was the one that I actually was, I was really, really intrigued kind of to talk to you about today. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's because, you know, right now we're in the midst of an unprecedented pandemic with COVID-19. Sure. And every industry is, is struggling to kind of continue to operate the best that they can. Yeah. Um, and, and I looked at kind of one of the events that happened in your business in August, 2016, your offices flooded. Can you, Kind of for everybody, what happened there? How substantial was it? And, and and what did you learn in that event? Sure. So yeah, in August 2016, um, uh, all of uh, you know we're headquartered in Denham Springs, Louisiana, which is right outside of Baton Rouge, and uh, you know have 100,000 residents, and I think 80 percent, 90 percent of the parish uh, flooded. Our office took on four feet of water. Um, you know, a lot of our personal, my personal house took on two feet. And so during that time, as you can imagine, there was a lot of scrambling and unknown. Um, and it forced us as a company very quickly to realize that if we wanted to keep operating, we had to do it with everybody working from home. Uh, until we found temp temporary offices, we couldn't just stop. Some of our communities um, experienced a lot of flooding. So we knew we had to be there for our residents and helping them and, um, and helping them guide, you know, the boards on how to handle financial issues. Yeah. And so we, we quickly realized that we had to go mobile 100 percent, right? Uh, cloud based and everything. Our, you know, thank God our server um, was uh, about four inches from going underwater uh, at our office when it flooded. And that would have been. Close? Oh, God, it was um, it was a blessing from God to be sure. Um, and, and, you know, at that point was when, you know, y'all had rolled out a, a cloud based software because up until then we were using Tops Pro uh, and it was all on our server. And we, we already started seeing that there were some inefficiencies there. Uh, anytime we needed service, y'all had to jump on. And so y'all had Tops IQ. And so it was just right around that time that we said, OK, yeah, we got to do it because now we can put all our stuff on y'all's server. Um, you can handle it that way. And it. It just helped us realize that the the way for us to be as flexible as possible was to be as mobile as possible. Yeah. Fast forward to today, um, of the 60 people in our workforce, 40 were already working remote, um, whether yeah. from home, uh, all of them from home, uh, or from offices on if they were on-site managers. And um, when we were given the orders, uh, the mandate by our governor that we had to, you know cease operations in office um we were basically able to move everybody home the other 20 people and the next day be up and running without a hitch um we're on tops one now so it was even easier everything already is in the cloud and so uh our phone systems are all cloud-based um and so the, the the 16 flood while it was very painful <laughs> yeah. um it it prepared us for where we are today and made us better which I think, again, as a, as a business owner, you have to realize that sometimes when you're going through the hard things, um, it could be losing contracts, it could be losing key employees. Um, you got to kind of look back and say that was probably for the best. I mean, I, I, you know, not to get too far off subject, but I know there's many times I've lost a contract when I was young, you know, younger in the company, younger in the business, and uh, I was really upset. And then I realized that there's some contracts you don't mind getting rid of. So there are a lot of bad things that can happen. Um, but if you look for ways to turn negatives into positives, it's always there. Yeah. So when you think about it, and it's, I mean, I think it's well said, when you think about this kind of timeline, I mean, you guys had this flood event and literally 30 days later, you're moving to the cloud. So your response wasn't to kind of buckle down, but your response was to immediately enact some kind of business continuity plan that got you ready for whatever that next thing is. 
Absolutely. You got to be, uh, I tell my team all the time, we are solution finders, not problem solvers. You know, I know problem solvers sounds like a positive connotation, but you, when you say it, you put the word problem first. Uh, we say we're solution finders. So anytime something happens, we're looking for the solution. That, yeah, I, you know, it's funny, kind of has the same meaning, but it actually, it, it totally has a different context when you say it like that. Yeah. So you think about this, over the last four years, you guys have effectively added 100 clients. You've remained on that steady growth clip that you've had for the preceding five years. Yeah. Uh, but now you look at your business today, you're in Louisiana, you're in Mississippi, you're in Alabama. Correct. You, how much has being on the cloud now unlocked all that for you guys? Oh, it's... Um... I would tell anybody who is looking to expand um, their market, um, not their verticals, but actually expand into other markets, uh, you, you have to be ready to be cloud-based, uh, even within your own local market. Um, today's uh, today's uh, labor force, one of the things they're going to be looking for is the flexibility um, to be able to work when they need to and where they need to. Um, you want to attract the top talent, you better find a way to give them perks. That doesn't necessarily mean you got to pay them more. Um, and so by being able to go to the cloud, um, it did a couple things for us. One, it expanded our talent pool. Uh, before, where I might have needed an AR uh, accounts receivable worker that actually lived in Baton Rouge, well, now I can have one that lives in you know North Louisiana or Mississippi um, because they can work from home because it's all cloud-based. So you expand your talent pool, uh, which expands your market. Uh, you can go other places. And then the other big thing that really helped us is the efficiencies I was talking about in that we were able to utilize Tops Pro, I mean, I'm sorry, Tops One and the cloud-based software to really cut a lot of our time down. Um, uh, I don't know how many people were, had used Tops Go at one point. Uh, we used that out in the field and it was a lot better than Pro because as you know with Pro, you have to go out in the field, take the pictures, create the work orders, and then come back and actually have to put it all in the system. It's a lot of time. With Tops Go, you could go out and do it in the field to a degree, but there was lag time. It didn't always come through right. When we switched to Tops One, one of the biggest things we saw was that savings of time of being out in the field um, because it was all able to be done while you're out in the field. Same thing with board meetings, same thing with general meetings. Everything could be done more efficient and quicker, which means less time having to be spent. And then on top of that, because y'all are such good partners with other industry leaders, we were able to use and leverage that to use other vendors to save us time with community mailings, uh, approving uh, approving uh, vendor payments, accounts payables. And so again, I think any business owner would understand that the more efficient you can be with your labor time, you're going to save a lot of money, which means your margins are better, which means you can put more money into the company, which means you continue to grow. Yeah. You know, when you talk about the expanding the talent pool, um, <clears throat> I didn't tell you this the other day, but we've got a client that has a, a nice management company out in the kind of greater Seattle area. And two of his staff accountants are right here in Florida, uh, yeah. right? Because for him to get the best talent, you know, using the, the tops one in the cloud, he can have his accounting staff recruit anywhere. And because he can hire them here, which is a kind of, honestly, it's a less expensive to live in, in Clearwater, Florida than it is to live in Seattle. Oh, Washington. Yeah. It allows him to keep his margins pretty good. It's a hundred percent accurate. And I mean, to me, um, anybody who is on the fence with going to the cloud and using all cloud-based software needs to understand how important what you just said is because especially if they live in a, a high cost of living area yeah. where they can find talent in other areas that maybe aren't or i mean to be quite frankly again i'll go back to there are a lot of my people that i've hired since we've gone fully remote that they've come to me and, and taken less money but they said what they attracted is that they could work from home um, and you just, people, you just, you don't realize though, not having to pay gas, not having to buy lunch every day, not having to buy a full wardrobe every season of clothes to wear to the office, that adds up for people. And then you add in the quality time that they feel like they can spend with their kid in the morning before they get on the bus, because before they had to leave to commute for an hour. Um, 
So it's not just the money they save, but it's the it's the quality of life you give them. Um, I would tell any business owner who hasn't tried it yet, they would find that uh, they would increase their talent pool and decrease their uh, their margins. Yeah, no, I think it's terrific. And so, I mean, you talk about this just on that one area, the amount of savings you guys were able to recoup in labor on the inspection piece alone, let alone patient mm -hmm. processing, centralizing data, people being able to work from home, just the overall kind of reduction of hard dollars there. So when you look at kind of this last kind of chapter or this kind of third chapter of your growth, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm pulling my notes up, so again, I apologize that I'm, I'm trying to do this as best I can. I mean, you guys over a 13 year window went from an idea to a 250 uh, community management company across three states with over 30,000 doors. I mean, yeah. that's a hell of a accomplishment. Thank you, thank you. I mean, we're, we're extremely blessed. We, and, and I, I say it all the time, I surrounded myself with good people and I gave, my, I gave my good people great tools and great software. I mean, that is, there, there really is no secret. Um, you can read all the, the books you want in life. Um, my, my philosophy is, is uh, you know, uh, first and foremost, uh, I put my trust in God. And then secondly, uh, I try not to be the smartest person in the room and I try to get software that I could barely understand, but other people can. <laughs> Well, let me ask you, like, has any of this worked out exactly like you planned? No, <laughs> no. Um, look, like I said, when we first started, I owned another company with my dad. And so this really was something that was more of a hobby. Right. And, and I promise you, our goal was if we get to 40 or 50 communities like we're all going to be sipping my ties uh, in, in, in Bali somewhere, you know, checking that mailbox money. And um you, you finally realize as you're growing and you're in the midst of something that you're onto something. Um, and again, you're really just trying to get out of your own way and how you get out of your own way. And I, I just keep saying it, but you get out of your own way by finding the right people, giving them more responsibilities and giving them the right tools. And if you do that, um, success generally follows. Yeah. You, you talk about that. And it's from 2010 till today, you know, TOPS and community management have been partners. And again, I think that's the operative word. I mean, that's how we approach relationships, yeah. how you approach relationships. Being candid, has it been rosy every day? No, uh, but I think you and us have always come at it from the same perspective. We want to do right by each other. Yeah. We want to invest in a relationship to because we believe in the importance of it. So when you look at some of the things that, again, acknowledging that no partnership is perfect all the time, you know, when you had chances over the years, you could have walked away. What made you continue to double down on the partnership with Tops? Sure, um, this is gonna be a long session, uh, and and I just I want to. This is we've got uh, yeah. like 17 minutes. Okay, well, so I will I will say um, you're right. It hasn't been completely rosy uh, at all. There have been um, bumps along the way from when we had Tops Pro. We moved to IQ and we moved to one and, and, and we've always had issues that we've had to work through. But um, I will tell you, there are a number of things for anybody who's listening to this about thinking about software that drew me to y'all and has kept me with y'all. OK, so I'm, I'm going to try to be as concise as I can. One, when we first started looking for software. Y'all were the industry leader. Uh, you had all the history um, and that was a big deal. Secondly, uh, your mindset was to partner with as many vendors in the industry as possible to allow your software to almost be an open source software where anybody who wanted to play in your sandbox could play. And what that allowed us to do is to be able to partner up with industry leading vendors and other aspects of the industry, banking, accounts payable, vendor management, uh, mailings, um, and they all worked well with you because y'all had spent so much time creating those partnerships. And what we didn't want is to have a software where we had to have five different pieces of software to do what one software could do. And by the way that y'all created in your mindset, that allowed it to happen. The, the other thing that really kind of kept me with y'all was the fact that y'all always have been willing to listen to what we need or what's not working and jump right on it. Um, when we had Tops Pro, uh, we really realized that a lot of things just, it was kind of starting to get stale a little bit. And y'all as the industry leader could have been like, you know what, it is what it is. We've been around for 20 years. We've been the best of the best. 
take it or leave it. But you did. You said, okay, this isn't working anymore. We've got to, we've got to, the industry deserves more. It's hungry for more. Let's do it. And y'all pushed for Tops IQ. And I think being nice, I would say that Tops IQ just wasn't quite what y'all envisioned, um, wasn't quite where you wanted it to be. And any other management, I mean, any other software company, I think would say, well, look, we've already invested years on this and money. IQ is what it is. We're just going to keep kicking it and kicking it until we get it right. But instead, y'all said, nope, it's not even close to what we really wanted at the end of the day. Um, it's good software, don't get me wrong. But you said there's something bigger and better that we had envisioned. And so y'all basically went back to the drawing board and came up with one. I don't think people appreciate how much investment in getting it right that takes because of how much money you lose when you do something like that um, as a software company. I know a little bit about it just because I had software that I developed a little bit with my other company and not to y'all's extent by any means, but that impressed me more, much more than anything else because you could have been a company that said, look, we're the experts. We know what we're doing. IQ is great. Put lipstick on a pig and just take it. But y'all didn't. You listened to a lot of your clients. You listened to the industry and you said, hey, this isn't quite what it needs to be. We want to be the best. We always want to be pushing the envelope. So we're not, even though we just sunk all this years and money into this revision of our big revision of our software, we're just going to revise it again and just sink more money and time. And so that to me showed a commitment to always wanting to get it right and to be the best. Um, and y'all continue to do it with some of your more recent things with the, the portals that you're doing. Um, Another big thing for me was your support staff. Uh, Terry's on here. I don't want to make him blush, but uh, Terry always would. I mean, I don't care if it was a Saturday, Sunday, uh, Monday at seven o'clock at night. Uh, I think he like one time I called him. He's like, hey, man, just give me a second. I'm walking out the room. My wife just had a baby. And I'm like, no, no, no go back. Go back. Go back. Um, just, just call me when you get a better chance. I think he called me like 30 minutes later. I was like, man, I meant like a week. You have a week off. But um <laughs> No, you've had a lot of great support staff, Mike. Uh, Terry, I will say, kind of leads the charge with that for me personally on my account. And my team has always told me that, that, you know, when they needed to get a hold of somebody there, um, when there was a big issue, it wasn't like, OK, well, we'll get back to you in three days, four days. It usually was the same day and y'all would be working on it into the night, over the weekend. Um, and to me, that not only helps me as an owner feel comfortable with who I'm working with and feel like we actually are, are cared about, but it made my team feel confident that, okay, look, he's given us the right tools. Even when they don't work, they jump right on it. I mean, we were talking about y'all today about I think there was like a little glitch with something in one, and one of your team members was on it like immediately, sent out, a, sent out, you know, sent out an email. And so to me – that goes a long way because no software is perfect. I mean, I've talked to a lot of my friends in the industry who don't all use tops and trust me, none of them go, Oh yeah, this was perfect. Never has problems. But what it seems like the conversation that always is different for me is, is well, yeah, but I, you know, I just talked to Terry last night or, or we just talked to Amanda yesterday or, or Javier jumped on a phone call and they're like, wait, what? You can get somebody on the phone. So to me, that's a, that's a big deal. Um, and then the, the, the last thing I would tell you is that the just the, the, the continuing to expand your service, the continuing to actually want to know the industry, like y'all know the industry. You're not, you're not a software company who decided I want to get in the management industry. You actually bring in people from the industry who have owned management companies, run management companies. So that when y'all are talking about what's the new greatest thing we need, you actually have people who have been there and done it. Um, and that goes a long way because sometimes you have software companies who just think they know more than the client. Um, and I've never gotten that from y'all. So yeah. I just, you know, again, I could keep going on and on, but y'all never settle for y'all never settle for second best. You're always looking to invest more time and human resources and getting better. Your customer service uh, is is second to none. Um, you know, I, I'm I'm glad Terry's still married because you know he's taking some of my calls that I mean you know it's, his his wife probably knows me by name. Um, uh, thanks for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and um, it just overall, man, it's just it's it's been like you said. Uh, I'll wrap it up with this. It's been it's felt like a partnership to me. Um, yeah. It's never felt like I've had to browbeat y'all. Y'all, I've never felt like y'all have ignored us. Um, 
And without that trust and a software and a tool and a partnership, uh, again, you can have all the best intentions in the world. You can have the best staff in the world. If you don't have the right tools for whatever you want to do, you're just not going to succeed. Yeah. Yeah. That's well said. Let's think about this because I want to kind of give a chance for you to kind of talk about this kind of next kind of chapter because we, we've talked about the growth that you guys have had kind of from beginning to here, the migration from QuickBooks to Pro to IQ to Tops One. But broadly, as you think about the next several years in front of us, like how are you changing the business today to make sure you guys remain competitive? And how do you see the market changing to uh, as far as their expectations of services? Sure. So we're, um, I think one of the biggest things is we, we, we continue to look to improve, right? Um, and I think any business, like you said, should never get to a point where you're like, oh, I've got it all figured out. Um, much to the chagrin of my team sometimes, uh, they tell me, you got to pump the brakes, Jeff, on changes. Like you, we can't we can't keep changing and adding and doing this. And um, I tell them, yes, we can. Uh, and we just put a smile on my face and say, yes, we can. But I think the biggest thing as far as the industry goes um, is we are looking at how to leverage technology for self-service and communications. Um, we think the today's residents, um, just like the today's consumers, want information at their fingertips, um, want to be able to answer their own questions if at all possible. Um, you know, back in the day when a resident had to call and say, can you, can you mail me a my ledger, right? They don't want that anymore. They don't even really want to sit on the phone anymore. They want to be able to say, hey, can I go somewhere and just find it myself, right? Um, same thing with boards. Uh, you know, sending sending monthly board packages that are, you know, 20 days old or 20 days stale um, is not going to be acceptable. We really need to find ways that boards can go in and run reports and see reports and see information about residents in real time when they want. So I think self-service is a big thing, and I think communication is a big thing. Um, we all digest our information in, in 120 characters or less these days. Um, sometimes yeah. not even sometimes not even words anymore. You know, Snapchat. Even though I I couldn't Snapchat or or, or tweet or whatever else is out there now if uh, you wanted me to, but I do know that a, a big wave of our population is. They want to digest their information in as few characters as possible. And so, how do we how do we communicate valuable information, strong messaging, but without a lot of words? Um, I have the gift for gab, so that's definitely somebody else in my company's uh, job to figure out. Um, but I do think with the uh, the addition that y'all are doing of the portals, uh, again to me showed that y'all kind of have y'all's finger on the same pulse um that y'all are hearing and seeing a lot of things in the industry that i think a lot of us that own management companies can appreciate that you you know we don't have to come to you and say hey guess what this might be a big deal it, you're already kind of coming to us and saying hey you might want to think about this um and so uh I, again i would say self serve making sure that you're positioning your company that you're able to offer that self-service because also from a business owner standpoint, think of how much time you spend answering resident phone calls and emails where they may ask, you know, what's my balance? Well, if they can self-service that, A, you don't have to answer that email or phone call, but we all know that phone call then turns into, well, can I tell you about my next door neighbor's poodle who pooped in my yard? Or can I tell you about the fence board that was been down on somebody else's property for five weeks? And a, a two minute conversation turns into a 50 minute conversation. Well, they were able to self-service that original question that that other used up time goes away, that inefficiency. So I would tell you that from a from an industry standpoint, that's where we stand. From a company standpoint, it's continuing to um really build our focus on our, our mission, our company's mission and our culture. Um, once you get to the size we're at, I find that the biggest challenge is keeping people invested and focused on what the bigger, greater mission is, right? If you get people to focus on their greater mission, then all of the self-interest and all the things that might take away from productivity kind of go away. I will tell any company who's thinking about going to a remote business model, you will have to figure out ways to be very intentional about keeping your team connected. Uh, we have to, we do daily, weekly meetings like we're doing right here where we can see each other's faces. 
Um, we do schedule things outside the office, um, team building exercises. So just to come full circle about being a remote and using the cloud-based, uh, the danger is you get people who lose a connection to the company and you just have to be very intentional about it. Yeah, that's a, those are really good points. And I, I think your comment about self-service is spot on. Yeah. Uh, some recent stats I saw were that 75% of people look to the internet to find an answer before they pick up the phone or send an email. And I can't help but think like to your point, that that innocuous call from a homeowner that could have been five minutes becomes 50 minutes because they get somebody on the phone, they talk about everything under the sun. If that person could answer that question online, you've just recouped almost an hour of somebody's staff time. Oh, yeah. And, and it, that's quite honestly, that's what motivates us right now is everything we're doing. If you look at kind of the road ahead and the things that you know you guys are, are participating in and some of the other things we're rolling out, uh, it's very much about not only giving you that platform for the business, but it's giving you all those labor multipliers that make your staff time more effective because that is your biggest expense. I mean, no matter what you pay for tops, it is probably less than a senior member of your team. Oh, and, yeah. And if, if through that technology, we can begin to automate how vendors interact with the communities, we can uh, automate how the boards and homeowners interact with their accounts, and during all this time, everyone's happy, everyone's getting their needs met, and your staff time is going down. Mm -hmm. You win, they win. There, there are no losers in that proposition. You're absolutely right. I mean, the, the more efficiency in a service industry that we are, efficiencies on our side will almost always equal better services to the client. Okay. Um, and so you don't have to, you know, there's some people who think you have to sacrifice one or the other. Well, okay, Jeff, you keep saying the word efficiency. That means you're just going to do a, a worse job for your client. No, I'm being more efficient for my client, which is also being more efficient internally, which allows me to then use that money that I'm saving to invest more in services, growth, and so forth. Yeah, I'd say this. Uh, there are things that technology can solve. There's things that a vendor portal, a board portal, a uh, homeowner portal, and online payment capabilities. There's things that technology can solve, but there's things technology can't solve. And that's where the valuable people you have, that's where they need to step up and showcase you know, what it means to be kind of a community management professional. Um, right. But if we can take all the, the annoying stuff out of the way, I think that's our job. Amen. <laughs> Let's do this. We got a couple minutes left. Uh, you talked about our support and about how we staff up with industry experts. And I think one of the things that does kind of you know allow us to be such a good partner for you guys and a lot of our clients is that you know we come out of the community management industry. It's our DNA. We have a number of people on staff that are PCAM, CMCAs, AMSs. We invest in people that understand the business of our clients so that we don't have to teach how people do their job. We just have to teach them how to support people that are doing that job. So whether it's support, whether it's success, whether it's our, our onboarding staff, our entire team is kind of staffed with people that understand this industry. And again, I do think that that's important when you think about being a good partner. But let's yeah. do this. We've got, we've got about one minute left, kind of recapping the story we talked about today. At that initial phase of your business, fair to say that the success you guys had was having a good vision and just being willing to put the hard work into it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So anybody, we, uh, go ahead. Yeah, we, we well, I was just going to say, yeah, I mean, in, in, in the beginning, I just wish we would have worked smarter and not harder, but sometimes you got to learn, uh, you got to learn that by just going through it. And again, what I mean by that is those first four years, um, we didn't only have a growth of 20 HOAs versus 130 the next four years because we decided to work harder the next four years. We just started working smarter. Hmm. That's a great point. So when you talk about that next phase, kind of that growth phase, you're know, being, uh, on working on the business not in the business was critical for you and you guys mm -hmm. and that investment in the tools that allow you to expand and take on more business more rapidly yep the tool the, the, the having the right tools was the, all, all the gr the growth was because of the tools i mean sure we had to get the right people on our our our, our team which that helped but again i think i told you before 
I could hire the best carpenter in the world. And if all I gave them was a saw and said, build a house. And I gave a mediocre carpenter all the power tools they want and said, build a house. Well, I know which one's going to build me the house. Um, and, and so we were just like this great carpenter, but with no tools to really do anything with it. And so um, th the growth was 100% linked to getting the right tools. Yeah. And when you think about that kind of next kind of big phase, it's all about identifying those systemic issues like business continuity mm -hmm. and continuing to really focus on your people, your culture, your markets. That's right. Getting rid of inefficiencies. Once you once you get your once you get your boat rowing and, and going in the right direction, then you got to decide, are you going as efficient as you possibly can? And, and that's when you have to start looking at. Um, do you have the right processes, the right people, and can you utilize your technology better? And then as you look forward, it continues to be kind of paying attention to the things that got you there, your mission, your people, your culture, but then really leveraging force multiplying technology everywhere, particularly now for you guys, that customer service level, getting the labor, as much labor out of that as possible. 100%. I tell my I tell my people all the time when they get uh, what I call technology fatigue because we're always looking for improving the technology. Um, the use and the expectations of the everyday consumers' appetite for technology is not going down; it's going up. So anybody yeah. who doesn't want to get on board with using technology and 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 learning new technology on an annual basis, you're just going to get passed up um, because it's it's not slowing down it's getting faster i agree with that well, let's do this uh we're we're right kind of at the top of the hour i'd like to maybe ask a couple questions from people that are kind of uh on the webinar maybe we can knock out one or two and then kind of wrap up right on time sure all right uh david asks what have you found is the best method for gaining new clients um we actually have found that we don't do we, we didn't really rely heavily a lot on like internet marketing um it mainly was word of mouth we mm -hmm. would we would form good relationships with our current board of directors and basically go to them and, and and say hey look if you have other people that are in other neighborhoods can you just get, kind of send us their information and a lot of it was just you know picking up the phone and calling those people so uh, you know, Dave on the board of this HOA might say, well, my sister Sue lives in another one. Um, she has, uh, she's either on the board or she knows a board member. Well, can we get their phone number? So a lot of it was cold calling. And then I'll also tell you that if you can, if you can find and develop relationships with builders or developers in your area, they don't have to be the big national ones. Um, you know, every, every, every industry, every, I'm sorry, every community has you know those developers who might do one or two neighborhoods a year um doing that will then begin to build your uh your footprint a lot quicker um and then i would just tell you the most of all is do a great job because if mm. you it, it it is it is a lot easier to grow by keeping the clients you have than having to go out and find more clients Amen. and i know that's easy for me to say because i'm sitting here with you know you got 250 clients you have come on haha -ha. but i will tell you that everyone we lose that I don't want to lose because there are ones that you want to get rid of if their if their time sucks. But everyone that I've lost that I didn't want to lose, it hurts just like the first one I ever lost. So, um, you know, you, if, if you do a dollar kind of met, metrics research, you'll find that it costs you more money to get a new one than to just make it the ones you have happy. Yeah, it's a great point. You know, kind of along the same question, uh, Ken asks, what are your thoughts on a company using direct mail to HOA board members to get new business? I don't, I don't think that would hurt. Um, you know, some, I, I know a couple of my friends in the industry are always worried about that when I tell them that, you know, we just cold call people. Um, my dad was a salesman growing up and there was two things he always told me. He said, the worst thing somebody can tell you is no. Right. And I'm gonna make them tell me no seven times. He <laughs> said, people usually will tell you no seven times before they give you a yes. Now I am not a salesman. OK, so I think everybody needs to understand that my my strong suit is operational processes and protocols, numbers kind of thing. Um, but I did learn that from him. So if you're sending out direct mailers, what's the worst they can do? They can throw it away. Yeah, they're, not gonna, they're not going to call you and like jump down your throat and say, wow, why did you mail me? I mean, 
we all know Secretary of State's in every in every state are going to have the board members' addresses on it. So go for it. You know, um, whether you're going to see a return from doing mail versus trying to, you know, get phone numbers. I, I will say that phone numbers and emails are going to work a whole lot better than direct mails. But we've done some direct mails and we've had some some success. And you know, the other fear is, oh well, I'm going to mail it to somebody who's being managed by somebody else, and that management company is going to call me. Well, okay, just say, hey, sorry, I. Yeah, didn't know. No, no harm, no foul. No, it's. I mean, it's a great point. Is that you know, uh, you don't know how good or bad a job they're doing. If you drop something in a person's mailbox, follow up with a phone call, an email. You know, you may get in a conversation. It may not turn into business today, but it might in, turn into business tomorrow. Um, and, yeah, and I just and just to cap both of their questions, uh, volume is key. Okay. Um, you know, if, if you think I'm going to send out 10 direct mailers to get 10 clients, you're crazy. You probably yeah. need to send out 100 direct mailers to maybe get three clients. Um, and so it's it, it, it sales. What I've learned is a numbers game. Um, so just keep that in mind. Yeah. And one last question, and then we can kind of wrap up for today. And I think it's a good one. Uh, this is also from David. Uh, in order to grow, you need really good managers. What has been your best resource or system for hiring managers? Sure. We, I will tell you the, the, the thing that helped us the most, um, because we went through a phase of not hiring the best managers and we had turnover. Then we went and put a lot of time and effort and investment into putting together um, personality profile testing. Okay. Um, and I know it sounds cliche and, so to anybody who's going, oh my God, here we go, all these kind of personality tests. We have found, what I did was I started personality profile testing, everybody in my company, especially all of what I would call my champions, right? My, the ones that I'm like, I will never let these people go. And a funny thing happened along the way is that you find that there's some common denominators, believe it or not, uh, amongst personality types. And so we found that when we now are looking for new hires, whether it's a manager or anybody, we're going to use that personality profile as one of the first or second phases of that interview process. Um, it's not the only thing. It's not, you know, uh, hard, cold fact, always going to work. But if, if somebody had, if their references are, eh, their, their background history is, eh, and then their personality profile is way off or even worse, it matches like one of the really bad people we had to let go then that, that has saved us. And I will tell you, since we started implementing using that process, um, our turnover rate is very low. Uh, a staff of 60, I don't know, I've lost two people in the last 18 months to two years. Um, so it's uh, it, it's been really good to, to really get the right kind of talent. Yeah, I think I'd, I'd actually, I'd love to learn more about that. You know, not maybe today, but- um, Sure, I've absolutely. I've thought about things like that too. You know, will you identify for that kind of that department, that, mm -hmm. that job function, what are the really best performers? What are they, you know, what are their personality traits and then kind of hire for that. Um, so I'd love to, <laughs> personally, I, I find that stuff interesting. So I'd love to learn more about it. Absolutely. Uh, well guys, that's all we have time for today. Uh, thank you everybody for attending. Uh, the case study that Jeff and his company, Community Management, participated in, we will be sending everybody or making available to everybody a copy of it so you can read all the details in it and you can read about the story of community management. Again, kind of like we talked about today, that in a relatively short window of time, how Jeff, you took a business from an idea to 250 communities across three states. Um, I hope everyone got as much inspiration out of this today as possible. Uh, you've been so generous with your time. So I just want to say thank you on behalf of everybody at Tops and everybody on the webinar, Jeff. Thank you for being available today. Absolutely, anytime. And, and everybody here, thank you so much. Uh, you'll get an email from us following up afterwards. You may be asked to participate in a survey just to give us feedback. If you do, please take a few moments uh, to share your thoughts. And again, we will be making that case study available to everybody very shortly. So on behalf of Tops, uh, Terry, I'm sorry, you didn't get to talk today. I apologize. <laughs> You guys talk enough. That's right. That's exactly <laughs> right. Little, 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 little. Uh, but on behalf of Tops and everybody here, thanks for making time today, guys. We hope you enjoyed it and look forward to seeing you guys again on a future webinar. Thanks.